now we are. All right, thank you all for, for uh, joining tonight. Um, we have a, a great presenter, Mark Serez, and I'll let him introduce himself in a moment, uh, but he's gonna talk about climate change and he um, learned a little bit about our group, so he has an idea of where you all come from and uh, the perspective um, uh, about polar truck training and how this relates to that. So um, yeah, we look forward to hearing from him. And again, like other presentations, if you have questions, just type them in the chat window. We'll relay it to um, Mark at the end and open it up for discussion as well. We are archiving this so that, are recording it so that we can have an archive and share it out with everybody um, in case you have to step away tonight. So I'm gonna turn this over to Mark. And I'll let you introduce yourself, Mark, and uh, share your screen. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen here. Give me a moment. And uh, we're going to pull up this presentation. Um, here we go. Everyone see it okay? Yeah, okay. So I'm Mark Serez, and I'm at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, and um, I do several things. Uh, number one, I'm director of the National Snow and Ice Data Center. We do a lot of data management for NASA. We do a lot of research on the cryosphere, snow and ice and all that. So I have to do that, of course. And then I'm also a researcher. Uh, done a lot of Arctic work, uh, oh, everything from sea ice to deep ocean to snow to clouds to atmospheric circulation, kind of a jack of all trades. I you could say, in sort of the, the world of Arctic climate, uh, and, but also I'm an educator. Uh, so I'm a professor within the Department of Geography. Um, right now I'm teaching a course uh, called uh, Geography 1001, Climate and Vegetation, which is kind of how the earth works 101. Uh, but I teach courses in like Arctic climate, kind of a general one, an advanced one. Sometimes I'll teach hydrology or whatever the department needs. So I kind of have to wear all those different hats. So what I was going to try to get across today is some of the key issues regarding climate change and what's it all about. And as you see from the title here, the issue being that the Arctic is leading the way uh, in terms of climate change, which it uh, certainly uh, is. So just to go on this, one of the issues that I think is often confused and often intentionally confused is the difference between weather and climate, right? So that when we're talking about weather, it's the day-to-day -day state of the atmosphere, short-term variations, right? Is it hot right now? Is it uh, going to, uh, we're gonna get a snowstorm next week? This sort of thing. Whereas climate is really the weather averaged over some time period, long time period, generally at least 30 years. And so it's kind of, you can say it's average weather, uh, but it's also information on like the extremes of weather. For example, what's the record high temperature, record low temperatures, what's the average daily range in temperature, uh, what's your uh, annual precipitation and how does it vary, right? Um, the problem that I often run into is, and I think a lot of people do that are trying, that are climate people, is that people tend to only remember last week's weather. And so the remarks will be, well, you know, you climate scientist, how can you tell us what's going to happen in 30 years when you can't even predict the weather well for a week? All right. You see that all the time. I think sometimes it's intentional. Um, sometimes it's not. Uh, the reality is that weather is actually very hard to predict beyond about seven days, whereas climate in some ways is easier. Because in weather, it's all about what we call an initial state. You need to know the initial state of the atmosphere very accurately. Then you can project it forward to what the weather is going to do. Well, as climate, it's more of what we call boundary conditions. That's going to tell us what the climate's going to be. It's stuff like uh, what's, what are the greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere? How much energy are you getting from the sun? Those are the important things in climate and climate change. So there's a difference there, and it's important to remember. Um, Going on on that, it's also important to remember uh, that the Earth's climate is always changing. It's always changed in the past. It will continue to change. Um, so it's never really stable, right? Uh, but also very important, it always has a cause. Every climate change has a cause. It may be difficult to know what that cause was, but that doesn't mean there wasn't one. 
So uh, it's not as if, um, and I got, I got, there's a, there's one nasty web piece about me on this once where I made some statement that, you know, it's not as if Harry Potter could just flick his magic wand and make the climate change, right? That doesn't happen. Everything has a cause. Uh, and uh, it may be hard to discern that cause, but it's always there. Uh, now, about the climate change over the past century, yes, we know what that climate forcing is, that cause, and it is absolutely us, no doubt. It is us. It, we're changing the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And as I just mentioned, the Arctic is really leading the way on this, which was something that was predicted, by the way, way back in the 19th century, that when we see climate change take hold, the Arctic is going to be the place where we really see it strongly. I just wanted to throw this up. I, you know, I talked about all climate change has a reason and the climate is always changing. You can go back to like the geologic time scale, going back, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of years, and you have these, these divisions in geologic time, like, you know, the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, Age of the Dinosaurs, before that, the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, uh, Carboniferous, and the Permian. These divisions are climate-based, really, uh, because a lot of them are based on evidence from uh, uh, the geological evidence, changes in sedimentary strata and things like this. And these really reflect climate changes. Uh, so that kind of tells you uh, that, you know, the climate has been changing uh, for a long time. Right now we're in, uh, well, we were in what we call the Holocene, the modern period. Uh, but now there is a lot of talk, it's even more than talk now, that it's, uh, we've entered a new age, right? The Anthropocene, the age of humanity, because the idea is if some, I don't know, alien race 10 million years from now goes back and digs into the earth, they'll see, oh, there's evidence that there was some species here, you know, which was building great cities and doing strange things. Now they're gone, you know, I don't know. But that's the idea. We're entering that age of humanity now, the Anthropocene. Now, just some of these climate changes, you know, there's evidence, for example, um, earlier than 650 million years ago, evidence of like a snowball earth, right? That the earth was pretty in frozen. It was all frozen up uh, pretty several, several times, perhaps. Uh, the whole world was Arctic. Why was that? The evidence for it is pretty good. Why was it? It's not quite clear why. Uh, because we really don't have the information of what that climate forcing was back then. But that doesn't mean this just happened by Harry Potter flicking his magic wand. There had to be a cause for it. Uh, could it be a period of reduced solar output? Uh, could it be that you, uh, I don't know, you move through some kind of uh, dust clouds and, you know, the galaxy? I don't know, okay? But it had a cause. Now, um, in terms of causes of some of the more recent climate changes. Uh, remember that like 25,000 years ago, we were at the height of the last ice age and there was a big ice sheet like this one, the Laurentide ice sheet covered a good part of, uh, part of North America. Uh, evidence for that like moraines, uh, oh, uh, like Long Island, Cape Cod, these are all moraine features uh, which were associated with the Laurentide ice sheet. We know the cause for these past ice ages and interglacials between them fairly well. They were paced by what we call Milankovitch forcings, which is periodic variations in Earth orbital geometry. For example, Earth's tilt, uh, it's 23 and a half degrees now uh, with respect to its orbital plane about the sun, which we call the ecliptic. It wasn't always that way. Uh, and when there's more tilt, we have stronger seasons, less tilt, weaker seasons. Also, the Earth's orbit is not circular, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, elliptical. And so at one time of the year, you're further from the sun, getting uh, less solar energy. At other times, you're closer to the sun, getting more solar energy. And these, these different processes have interacted to lead to changes in how much solar energy the Earth's surface receives at different latitudes and at different times of year. We know that these have paced these big ice ages. Uh, and, and the interglacials between one. We're in one right now. Uh, we're scheduled to go back into another ice age, maybe 30,000 years from now, something like that. Uh, but of course, probably depends on us now. So we also know in terms of these climate forcings uh, at shorter time scales, solar variability. That's something that can force a climate change. Less energy from the sun or more energy from the sun. Uh, the Little Ice Age of like the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. You've probably heard of that. 
uh, there's good evidence that it was in part due to a period when there was less solar energy. In other words, the sun wasn't shining so strongly. Um, good evidence for this from sunspot records, which we have for over 400 years. There was a period called the Maunder Minimum back then, where few sunspots were measured. And we know from direct observations that when we have few sunspots, the actual uh, sun doesn't give you quite as much solar energy. Strong evidence. Um, also, uh, what the solar activity varies. Uh, it, 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 it influences how much ultraviolet radiation that you get. And that's important because, of course, it's the ozone of the stratosphere that absorbs ultraviolet radiation. So changes in that change the stratosphere, and it turns out that can change the weather at the surface. So there's another example. You know, you, sometimes you hear these skeptics out there saying, oh, you scientists, right? Haven't you just forgotten that solar variability is important? And no, no, we're not forgetting it at all. As a matter of fact, if you look at just the climate records or the instrumental record, if you're careful in your analysis, you can see evidence of solar variability, uh, like the 11 year sunspot cycle. Um, now, the thing is, there's all kinds of these climate forcings, of course. Uh, uh, volcanic activity on short time scales, solar variability, these Milankovitch forcings. But of course, the one we're talking about now is a different one, is that we're changing the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, we know that carbon dioxide is a heat trapping gas, a greenhouse gas. If you, uh, uh, don't, uh, if you don't believe that, then you've got to ignore why we use infrared spectroscopy and various technologies like that. Uh, so uh, anything from your uh, heat seeking missiles to your uh, microwave oven uh, depend on our knowledge about how different substances absorb and emit radiation in different wavelengths. So we know this pretty well, right? Now, one of the things that's very important in the whole climate change issue is feedbacks like this. We have processes that can cause a change. These Milankovitch forcings I talked about, those are those orbital variations, or the sun putting out a little less or a little more energy, or changes in greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere. You increase greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere, cause it a little bit of warming. But then there are these feedbacks that kick in, which can amplify the warming. The best known, or the one that's often cited, I have a nice one here, a uh, picture here, the albedo feedback. So the idea is you warm things up a little bit by some process, and you cause more melting of the Earth's snow and ice. And the snow and ice is, of course, white, very bright, reflects solar energy. But that then reduces the reflectivity of the surface when you melt it. Lower albedo. Albedo is just a fancy word for the reflectivity of the surface. And that means that more solar energy is absorbed, which leads to further warming, which leads to further melting, which leads to a further reduction in albedo, and so on. Very well known, uh, and this is why the polar regions are, of course, very important, because that's where a lot of the snow and ice is. This is one of the best known feedbacks that can amplify the change. Another very, very, very important one is water vapor feedback. So you warm the climate up for some reason, increase the carbon dioxide level, turn on the sun a little bit, uh, whatever you want to do, you warm it up a little bit, well, then you are going to hold more water vapor in the atmosphere because the amount of water vapor the atmosphere can hold is temperature dependent. Well, the important thing here is water vapor is a greenhouse gas. And as a matter of fact, it's the most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. It's uh, what carbon dioxide is a very small amount compared to the water vapor in the atmosphere. But water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Well, if you put more water vapor in the atmosphere, that increases the greenhouse effect and causes further warming and so on. Uh, some of these skeptics will say, oh, you scientists, right? You don't even talk about water vapor, the most abundant greenhouse gas. Yes, we know all about it. The thing is what water vapor is, it's a slave to the carbon dioxide. If I threw a bunch of water vapor up into the atmosphere, just threw it up there somehow, it would quickly come out because we have a very vigorous hydrologic cycle. It would soon just precipitate out. Uh, so it really can't cause warming all by itself. But if I add carbon dioxide to the mix, that's a long lived greenhouse gas. It stays up there for a long time. That warms things up. Now, because you're a little warmer, you can hold more water vapor in the atmosphere. So the water vapor is an important greenhouse gas, but it acts as a slave to the carbon dioxide and participates in this very strong water vapor feedback. So you look at the warming over the instrumental record, right? 
you see there's a lot of ups and downs. This is going back to 1880 through basically the present. I don't think it has 2019 on there, uh, but uh, uh, that was tied for, tied for second highest, I think. But yeah, we're warming up, and that is certainly us. Now you see there's ups and downs and ups and downs on that. And that is uh, aspects of natural variability, everything from variations in ocean circulation to volcanic eruptions, Mount Pinatubo is in there, uh, other volcanic eruptions, all kinds of things, El Nino, La Nina cycles. These all can contribute to these variations in temperature for every year. So you see we're going up, 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 but it's not steady because there's always been this natural, what we call internal climate variability has always been there. It always will be there. So we'll see what happens this year. We know we'll probably be in the top five or so warmest, I would expect, where it sets in the record books. We will just have to wait and see. And this is why, the Keeling curve, okay? This is the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. This is from the Mauna Loa Observatory. This record goes back to 1958. Uh, we are now at something like 415 parts per million. When the record started, uh, they were around 315. Turns out from uh, ice core records, we actually have records of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere in past times from ice cores. And they never really got up over the past 700,000 years. They never got up about above about 280. Okay, so we're basically off the charts. Uh, that's one of the important things about paleoclimate records, records of the past. They put the present in perspective. It is us, is the conclusion. What are we seeing? Rising sea level, of course, because we're losing snow and ice. Well, we're losing land ice, the Greenland ice sheet, Arctic glaciers and ice caps are a big contributor to this. You're taking water that was on the land and now dumping it into the ocean. But there's a thermal expansion as well. Uh, and that's because the density of water actually depends on temperature. When you warm up the water, it becomes a little less dense and it occupies a larger volume. So the sea level rise that we see, and this is fact, we have measurements of this from tide gauges going way back. Now we have satellite altimeters, which can give us information. It is going up. And where are we gonna be by the 21st century? Maybe a meter higher than today. And now that depends on whether that's big, depends on where you are. If you're in Miami, where you're already dealing with sea level changes, problems, that's a big thing. Here in Boulder, Colorado, we're a mile high, we're probably gonna be safe, right? Right now, the sea level rise is about 3.2 millimeters per year, something like that, but it's year after year, and it's gonna get bigger. Uh, but now, I mentioned the Arctic, right? The Arctic leads the way. All right, Arctic amplification. This is a map of temperature changes uh, through the year, uh, annual average 1960 to 2018. I couldn't put one more year on there. And uh, this is basically what the temperature change has been over that point from some kind of a linear regression analysis. Anything in the oranges and reds is where it's warming. And most areas are warming, right? But you look where the big red is, right? Arctic, right? That is, has even has a name, it's called Arctic amplification. The Arctic is warming up at roughly twice the rate as the rest of the globe as a whole, right? So it, it really is happening in the Arctic. That was predicted way back in the 19th century that that would in fact be the case and here it is. Uh, some of the bigger changes we see is the sea ice cover, right? I think you already well know the Arctic sea ice cover is shrinking. These two images side by side are just showing the seasonal cycle of ice, in other words, Usually you have your peak in ice extent around March 15th, and we just passed our peak actually about a week ago, a couple weeks ago. Everything in kind of the purples is a false color composite, of course. Uh, that's what you'd have at the seasonal peak. And the one on the right, September 15, 2018, kind of shows you what you have at the end of summer. And the end of summer is kind of the best time to look at the health of the ice cover because it's really saying how all the growth has occurred during autumn and winter and all the melt in spring and summer, what have you got left? That's September. And so we often look at September ice extent as the sort of uh, indicator of the health of the ice cover. And there it is. Uh, that goes back to 1979. That's when we have good records from satellite. We can actually extend that record back uh, quite a bit further. Uh, certainly to the early 1950s and through other sources of information back to about 1900. And so what we see is pretty crazy, right? In September, we're losing something like 13% per decade in terms of the ice extent. That's how many square miles or square kilometers of ice are covered. There's a record low in 2012, 
has yet to be beaten. We picked up a little and then we went down again. Uh, this uh, year, 2019, ended up being tied for the second lowest. Again, you see those ups and downs like you saw on the temperature record. That's just the natural variability in the system, especially summer weather patterns have a lot to do with that. We're losing that ice. Now, we're losing the ice because it's getting warmer in the Arctic, but here's an example of a feedback. Because we're losing the ice, that also makes it warmer. So in other words, the ice loss itself is a contributor to that Arctic amplification through this albedo feedback. This puts it in perspective, and I often use these sort of things in class because they're very effective. If we were to look at the ice extent in September in 1980, it would have been the entire contiguous United States minus Senator McCain's home state of Arizona, right there. Just turns out that's how the numbers worked out. But if we looked at 2012, uh, what we had lost is the equivalent of all those blue states, right? Everything east of the Mississippi, all the uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, that's what we lost, right? So I always find that images like this really help to put things in perspective. It's kind of that image people can say, oh, that's a lot of real estate. So we find that these uh, sort of uh, analogies are helpful. Just a personal thing, uh, I started doing work in the Arctic back in the early 1980s, studying two little ice caps way up on northern Ellesmere Island, uh, and they're dead. Uh, basically, in 2015, when we got imagery, they were at 5% of their original size. These were just, you know, these were not big ice caps, they were little guys. We looked at the imagery for this last summer, they are dead, they are gone. And this kind of really put things personal to me because I've been studying climate change for years, but you know, my little ice cap, they weren't mine, they were Can Canadian government's ice caps, but uh, I thought they were mine, you know, I kind of own them, they're gone, right? So this made it very personal to me, you know, what's happening in the Arctic. Uh, thawing permafrost is something a lot of you are familiar with, right? We're seeing a permafrost to thaw, that's perennially frozen ground, massive changes to landscapes, uh, there's a, a, a severe coastal erosion in places along the Beaufort Sea coast, kind of a triple whammy because the permafrost is warming and thawing, but now we have bigger waves coming in because you don't have sea ice where you used to. And not only that, the ocean waters are warmer. And so you have a thermal erosion, you have a mechanical erosion. This is just one example. This is, uh, I think, Arena Overeem, colleague of mine, took that. And permafrost carbon feedback, a nasty potential feedback. The issue is there's all kinds of carbon locked up in permafrost soils. Uh, twice as what's in the atmosphere today, something like that. And so the concern is, is that permafrost thaws, the critters in the soil, the microbes become active, they start eating the carbon. What do they do? They breathe out carbon dioxide or methane, depending on the situation, adding to the atmospheric load, making it warmer, and so on. A potentially nasty feedback. Once, you, once this happens, it's kind of hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Questions out there, when might this kick in? If it kicks in, is it going to be a small thing? Is it going to be a big thing? We don't know. There's a lot of work on that. I'm involved in some work on permafrost now uh, uh, with a colleague of mine. We're theoretically heading up around Fairbanks to look at some of the uh, relic permafrost areas, but we'll see what happens with the whole COVID thing. So again, where do we go uh, over the next, uh, over the end of the century in terms of warming? A lot of it depends on us. Uh, it really, a lot of it is up to us. People ask the question, how warm will it be in 2100 relative to today, whether it's in the Arctic or globe as a whole? It's not a well, very well phrased question. The question needs to be based on some assumed emission scenario of carbon dioxide, how warm will it be? So really the future is up to us. These are just different scenarios of greenhouse gas growth. The A2 is kind of a gung-ho burn baby burn scenario. Uh, and this is kind of the one we're on right now, which is unfortunate, uh, but uh, uh, there's a lot in store, but the future is up really to us. So I just wanted to end here. I was asked to uh, say something about the role of scientists in education, science communication. So as I mentioned, I'm director of NSIDC. We're a center of about 95 people uh, doing data management, doing research, and we are very strongly involved in uh, you know, outreach, education, people come to us all the time, media come to us all the time asking questions about what's happening to the sea ice cover in the Arctic. And we view ourselves as just honest brokers of data and scientific information. We actively avoid stepping into advocacy. 
because we view that this is our value. It's just someone out there that has the correct information, unbiased information, and is willing to provide the best scientific explanation of what is happening. We feel as a center that if we step into advocacy, that's not what we want to do. We've been approached for, uh, for example, by like Greenpeace, Sierra Club, you know, they want to use their logo or someone's taking some dog sled trip across the Arctic Ocean to raise awareness of climate change. You know, they want to use us. They want to say that, well, we've got the label of NSIDC and we don't. We say no, because we think that that's stepping into an advocacy uh, area, which we as a center don't want to do. Something my own, I also observe, just as an educator, uh, I'm seeing way too few students entering college with, with no basic understanding of physics and math. This is a real problem. Uh, there's a lot of students who go into like environmental studies majors and things like that. And the problem is you can slide through a major like that and never really get a grasp at the physics of the problem. And that, that's an issue because only so many, so many people can, you know, be hired by Greenpeace to go door to door or something. Um, another thing I see is the real problem is too few students coming in with adequate writing skills. Maybe it's the Twitter error, you know, it's the texting error or something like that. Um, it's a problem. Uh, and there's always the students who are really good. You know, let's be clear, there's always those stellar students coming in who are, you know, naturals at the physics and the math, they can write. Students who can write, I tell them, look, you are way ahead of the curve if you can do this, uh, because too few can. And then on the whole issue of science communication, you know, I do a lot of stuff with media and things like that, as a number of us do uh, at, at the, in our center. And the one thing I've learned is that it's not the sort of thing that you can learn in a class or something. You know, our experience is that you just have to do it. Uh, and, and you have to learn from it. You know, there's a lot of armchair authorities out there, you know, oh, you should do your communication this way and that way. And, and, you know, my own experience and the experience of many in our center is that the only way to learn how to do it sometimes is to do it and to learn from your mistakes. And yes, you will learn from your mistakes. And you will find also, we find that if the media gets the story half right, you're probably doing okay. So with that, I probably ran a little bit long, but not too far, but uh, thanks everyone. I appreciate it. Good job, very nice presentation. All right, um, yeah, we're, we're open for questions here. Yeah. So everyone. there was a lot of uh, things going on in chat, but feel free to open up your mics and ask your questions. Oh my God, 32 directly. in a minute. I can't read all those. <laughs> No. Yeah, you don't have to read those. So I'm going to have them uh, ask their questions. So go okay. ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Bridget. Um, you were talking about the data collection at Mauna Loa. Mm -hmm. um, I understand like keeping it at the same place over and over throughout the years, but is there a reason they chose that site for data collection? I think they, they chose it in part because of its remoteness, is my understanding. They've been an observatory there for a long time. Uh, but they chose it in part for its remoteness. Uh, so it was clean air, so to speak. Now, subsequently, their carbon dioxide levels are being monitored at a whole bunch of sites across the globe now. Uh, closest one to me is up on Niwot Ridge, which is uh, in the Rocky Mountains here. It's about 30 miles from here where they're collecting it. So these records are now collected all over the world and they all agree with each other as they should. The thing about carbon dioxide is well mixed in the atmosphere. Sure, if you go to the top of a smokestack, you'll measure especially high values, but it's kind of well mixed through the atmosphere and all the records we have are very consistent with each other. But that, my understanding is why it was originally chosen in part is with its remoteness, you know, clean air. You can really see what's going on. So does the altitude not affect the amount of CO2 in no, the atmosphere? No, 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 very, very little. Um, up to, uh, up through what we call the troposphere. Okay, up to the base of the stratosphere, uh, the uh, carbon dioxide levels are well mixed. In other words, if you go higher and higher in the atmosphere, atmospheric pressure goes down, atmospheric density goes down. So in other words, if I took a box of air at sea level, okay, uh, it weighs about a kilogram. Uh, well, if I took a, a cubic meter of a box of air with a cubic meter at sea level, it weighs about a kilogram. If I took a box, a cubic meter box of air, at uh, you know several miles up, it's going to be a lot less mass in it because there's a lot fewer 
uh, molecules in it, but the proportions of oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide are all going to be about the same. The exception is water vapor. Water vapor is very much concentrated low down in the atmosphere. And uh, so if you go up high, there's much less water vapor. But carbon dioxide is very well mixed with the troposphere. So that's not an issue. OK, so uh, myself and several people, being a, a middle school educator, say, what really, you know, would you say are the top, you know, you talk about the college kids and you can see it way before that, honestly, but you know, what is the, what is the message? What should we really be focusing on at that stage? Do you feel? In my opinion, it's STEM. I mean, you, you've got to understand what's going on. You've got to take the time to do the hard stuff, right? You've got to take the time to learn some math You've got to take the time to take those physics courses, basic ones, you know, which you get in middle school or seventh, eighth grade, at least. And you really need to do that. Um, and you've got to get, in my experience, you've got to get them early. You know, to get people uh, trying to take these courses in college, it's too late. It's too late at that point. No, you've got to get them really early. That's, that's what I'm seeing. And... Uh, and the hard thing is, is to make it cool, right? You know, that this is cool stuff. This is interesting stuff. And it's not so much the brilliant ones. There's always the standout students who really get it and are driven. There's always those, right? It's kind of more in that common denominator, right? It's the basic level of sort of scientific literacy is the problem that I see. And that's what you got to hit on. And that, that's, my, that's my observation coming from the college ranks and seeing it. Right. It's just for me, it's, uh, I, I think I hear what you're saying. You know, just the fact that, you know, following a, uh, an idea across, you know, a, a couple of steps, problem solving, yeah. following the scientific method. It's just, it seems to be becoming more of a lost art well, it, it is, and the internet era hasn't helped because it's, it's the Wild West. Anything goes, right? And, and for me, you know, I can go to any internet site and I can tell you right away, is this bull or is not, okay? Right. Because I've been steeped in it. I know the science and like that. But, but if you're not, if you don't have a decent level of scientific knowledge, it can be very, very difficult to separate out what's good information and oh, sure. it's not. Yeah, and the misconceptions build up so early, and those are those are extra hard to break. That's right. That's right. It's the thing. Oh, uh, the one I hear a lot. Oh, the carbon dioxide is in such trace amounts in the atmosphere, it can hardly matter, right? You know, and I asked them, well, you know, if I gave you a glass of lemonade and I told you there was only a little bit of arsenic in it, right? You know, <laughs> maybe you won't drink it. <laughs> yeah, I tell my students, you know, just because you can Google something does not make you smart. That's right. That's right. And that, but it's a challenge, you know, to know what's good information and it is not. And that takes some training or, or it takes a level of knowledge. Thank you. And um, I had two questions. Sure. Um, I'll build off of what kind of John was talking about is, um, and I don't know if this is really a question as it's more of an observation that, you know, I think sometimes as science teachers, we miss the opportunity that the uh, mathematics that is happening in our classes applied mathematics, where yeah. they're in their algebra classes or, you know, their, their standard core math classes, it's, you know, it's in isolation. Um, yeah. So I think that that's something we need to maybe, me personally need to leverage um, a little better with our students is giving math context. And it's not just a not just here's a random set of numbers or here's a random graph or here's a random formula. Like it's got to have context to it and meaning. Uh, yeah. It's got to have context. And, and again, my experience is that understanding the applications of the math. Okay. So case in point. Okay. So I took, uh, you know, taking calculus, I remember. Okay. I didn't have nearly as much as I should have. Okay. But, uh, 
the way it was presented is like, oh, if we're going to take an integral or something. Well, we can think of it as taking this graph and a line on it. We can think of breaking it into little, little uh, rectangles and little triangles and adding up all the areas and things like that. And that's kind of what we're trying to do. But no, 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 we have great things like chain rules and things like that. So that's not really how we do it. But then you get out into the real world. And you find out, no, this is exactly how you do it, right? Yes. You're estimating an you're estimating, you know, an area, right? If I had known things like that back then, it would have been very, very much more effective to me uh, because I would know what the application was. I would know why we want to learn this, right? But yes, the context is important, right? Not just a bunch of random numbers, but let's take something like the temperature record from your city, which you can grab, right? And let's look at this and let's graph this up and let's understand this, understanding graphics and understanding if you're doing basic statistics, understanding let's run a regression line through that, right? And that provides that context. And now I thought, so I very, very much agree with you. It's the context, but understanding the math of why this is important. Right. Um, and then going back to um, Mauna Loa, the graph that you had up there with the Keeling curves, the yeah. little zigzag, yeah, that's little blip, yeah. seasonal, you know, yeah. that's summer versus winter. That's right. Situation that's right. It's in northern freezing. Hemisphere. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, and, but that's just from the northern hemisphere. Is that global? That's right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's global. You see it globally. Okay. Because the yeah. thing is, the, car the, car yeah. the carbon dioxide is mixed pretty quickly through the atmosphere because you have a pretty vigorous atmospheric circulation. So it gets pretty mixed uh, pretty quickly. Although, you know, if you want to say you went to the top of a smokestack, it would be a different thing, right? But it's mixed pretty well. And so, yes, what you are seeing, of course, is the planet breathing, essentially. You're seeing, you're seeing the living planet, right? Because uh, at most of the land area is in the northern hemisphere, and spring and summer comes along, photosynthesis starts, so you start sequestering carbon and leaves and other woody materials and roots and like that, and then autumn comes along and, you know, it rots, right, and it goes back to the atmosphere, but it's, the process is driven mostly by the northern hemisphere because that's where most of the land is, right, not all, right, you know, but, uh, but you, you will see that signal globally. Well, and it always seemed to me that, uh, you know, the uh, southern hemisphere, uh, the southern ocean is really in the spot where you would have the, the tundra and the taiga right. and right. all of this massive uh, amount of uh, biomass that we have in the northern hemisphere. That's, yeah. to me, it's got to be a huge impact right there. Yeah, that's right. And of course, you know, the photosynthesis is not just on land, right? It's in the ocean too, phytoplankton and things like this, right? So they play a big role as well. And from what we can gather, um, you know, in times past when we had, what we see through the, the record uh, of the ice ages from ice cores is that uh, global temperatures have pretty much tracked carbon dioxide levels for the past million years or so, right? And that's a feedback, actually. Uh, right now, the carbon dioxide is a forcing. You put it in, it makes it warmer. Or you take it out, it makes it colder, right? But we're not doing that. But in the past, it's acted as a feedback. In other words, we have like these Milankovitch forcings kick in. We start to cool things down. Carbon dioxide comes out of the atmosphere and into ocean reservoirs. And the Southern Ocean plays a big role in that, right? So it draws carbon dioxide out and that makes it cooler. So the carbon dioxide acts as a feedback in that case. And then it warms up a bit and the Milankovitch forcings change, the ice sheets start to melt and it starts to warm up a little bit. That carbon that was stored in the ocean comes back out into the atmosphere, right? So the oceans play a huge role in terms of just the, you know, the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere today through their photosynthesis. But the Southern Ocean, the deep Southern Oceans especially, have played a big role in modulating carbon dioxide concentrations for a long time. So, you know, carbon cycle is quite fascinating. So, um, I'm an informal educator. I'm actually over in Basalt, not too far from, I mean, three hours from you. <laughs> um, and I'm always curious about, I, 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 the so what resonates so much with me, that context where keeping things relevant and so forth when teaching. And I'm just curious though, as a non-formal educator, I don't even know from my experience, 
what is the NC, in the National Sloan Ice Data Center, like, edu what's the center's education, um, what's the emphasis on education or strategies or programs? And because it's obviously really clear that there's a need for building this identity connections with educators and scientists, which we're doing right now, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. But um, what else? What else are you guys up to that we could plug into or that you, we could collaborate, we collectively can collaborate with, or I don't know. I don't I'm just so curious. A, no, we, we um, of course, we have a lot of things like frequently asked questions. We have sites called like, the cryosphere today, where you can go and get all kinds of information on the cryosphere, which is snow and which is just your snow and ice cover. But we have several uh, pages which are very interesting. Which uh, one of them is called Arctic Sea Ice News and Analysis, ASINA, A S I N A. If you just Google on NSIDC, you'll get right there on the front page. You'll see it. And what it is is the blow-by-blow -blow account daily of what's happening to the sea ice cover, where every day we update the charts and graphs of what is happening. And then every month we have a post where we discuss what's happening to the sea ice cover in contrast to other years and uh, putting it into perspective. And last year alone, we had something like, well, over three and a half million visits to it. And what we found is that the audience on that is everything from fellow scientists who just want to track the sea ice right down to a fifth grader doing a science report. So it's a huge uh, audience that we're trying to serve. And the way we write these posts is to make them accurate yet accessible, right? And people say, well, you can't do that. You know, you can't write the science stuff, but stay accessible. No, you can't. You avoid things like you don't say the word anomaly, right? Oh, something's wrong, right? You don't say the mean temperature. Oh, the temperature's being mean? No, no. Say the average temperature, things like this. But people use this all the time. We've had a lot of educators go to that because you can really tell every day what is happening, okay? We have another one that's just launched, okay, called Snow Today, where what we are doing is we are tracking snow conditions across the western United States on a daily basis. So you can go there and you can tell how much snow is there, how does it compare with other months, uh, how deep is the snow, all these sorts of things. And so we're getting this user base, developing it, I think very strongly, of people who, uh, uh, of we have places to go where you can really easily, easily track what is happening in terms of uh, you know, in terms of, in our case, the cryosphere, right? So those are some of the things we do. We are very active in working with the media because we've just been doing it for a number of years. So we're in their sort of electronic Rolodex, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, and so we're frequently called on in that case. Um, and that's kind of a different thing, you know, dealing with the media. But in terms of the education, you know, those sites I talked about, they've proven to be very effective. Uh, and so those are a couple that I could recommend. Certainly Arctic Sea Ice News and Analysis. Uh, we're just putting together a post right now. Uh, this will be the, the monthly post that'll describe what happened in March. Uh, and that's going out either tomorrow or Monday. It's, so we're putting the final touches on this. On our right as a follow-up, do you guys ever incorporate like the Community Snow Observer or Citizen Science yes. data into that snow today? Yeah. Or yeah, other yeah, citizen yeah. Science yeah. Pro are there other citizen science types of projects that are, you're incorporating data from that we could all contribute to? Okay, we're, we're starting on one now. Okay, for the Arctic Sea Ice News and Analysis, what we generally do is that we invite contributions from other scientists who have some new study or something like that. So it's not really citizen science, I suppose, it's scientists. We have a new project right now that is starting up, uh, which is studying rain on snow events in the Arctic. And uh, the issue here is that it's warming up, so you get these situations where you get rain on an existing snowpack and then it freezes. And so then, uh, like the reindeer can't graze or the muskox can't graze. And you've had situations where like 30, 40,000 at a pop have died from starvation. And so we are working uh, in part with local observers, okay? And it is part of what's called the LEO network. I don't know if you know that the LEO network, the local, uh, the local environmental observers, it's the LEO network, okay? 
and we're working with a whole network of people now in Alaska. And so these are like people going out doing things, right? And they'll make observations about what happened and it'll report back through this Leo network. So I could give you a, I could uh, send you information on that, but we're using that uh, that's a sort of a you know citizen science local observing network that we're starting to take advantage of in this new project. In other words, we're studying rain on snow events for the last 30 years and what's happening. And we have actually partners in uh, Scandinavia as well, working with like Minette's reindeer herders and things like this. So we've got kind of another observing network that we're developing uh, on that. Now there's also a, another one called ALOKA, E-L-O-K-A. Uh, and that's something we have at NSIDC, which is dealing with local observations of change in the Arctic, okay? So those are kind of all Arctic focused, but that's kind of the ones we've got anyhow. But this LEO network is a good one. But you can send me, send me I can send you information. Hi, um, this is Maggie, I'm in Denver. And um, I've used quite a bit of data from NSIDC in my classroom lessons Good. and um, you know it it feels pretty overwhelming at first but with a little bit of time it really does come together and and it's pretty effective and so I was thinking um, I think to Sarah's question and myself as well really wanting to build that connective tissue between these amazing data sets and our kids um, I'm wondering if perhaps Janet and the polar track team could help us to design some sort of um, collection space for lessons that we build. Because as we build lessons using this data, it would be great to have them all in one place. Um, and I've talked to folks in the past from NSIDC about that, and it mm -hmm. seems like we maybe need some help to figure yeah. out a good way to store lessons to have available for other teachers. It might be a productive, um, little Avenue. Yeah, I, don't I know think what, your thoughts are. what we need is, is we would like to hear from you what's going to be more most useful. Okay, that will really help us. Oh, we have things like we store the ISIC stats for every month and like that in spreadsheets and things like that. We have all kinds of stuff like that. But it would help us to know what from your experience, what you think is the most helpful thing, right? Uh, and that would help us. We're always trying to improve things and improve this site, right? Uh, in terms of the graphics and in terms of the tools you've got for comparing ice from one period to another. But we would probably benefit from understanding from you what you think is is going to be the most. Now, are you middle? What 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 sort of level are you at? Middle school? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I muted. Um, yes, I'm in middle school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we would we would appreciate that information. Okay. I'll reach out, thank you. Well, um, I'm sorry to hear that you lost your ice caps. Terrible, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I have, it's, I have a book that I wrote, uh, came out last year, it's called Brave New Arctic, The Untold Story of the Melting North, and it starts with that story, you know, of how my ice caps disappeared. I didn't choose the title to publish it, I thought it was a little Aldous Huxley-ish, but you know, that was them, so. But yeah, they're, they're gone. I'd like to go back up there. There's still a cairn up there that has half a bottle of Jameson's whiskey in it. So, um, right. Is there any data that you could collect from those sites now if you went back to them that would help you in any of your research? I would push this. What, one of the pieces of research that's happening now is that um, as these ice caps recede and disappear, okay, there's organic matter that people can carbon date, okay? And from that, they can tell when was the last time that these areas were ice free, okay? So that you can use this information to date kind of the history of these ice caps. Like these little ice caps that I was on, we think they probably formed Little Ice Age, maybe 500 years ago, we're not sure, okay? But uh, getting people up there uh, to do that sampling would, would be valuable. There's also very interesting research that you've had, uh, when these things recede, some of the plants there suddenly come to life, bryophytes, okay, you know, mosses, okay, that have been buried for centuries, okay, and the ice retreats, they come back, 
right? It's pretty bizarre, right? But yeah, I think there's a lot that that you can you can go up there and 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 get information on, you know, about the history of these things. Um, you know, I, I'd have to get up there. So oh, it's not not so easy uh, to do. Uh, Sarah Bartha. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I have some questions. I just want to see if any other new folks have questions that haven't had a chance to speak up yet before I do. Okay. Um, we, uh, most of us here are science educators, but we have a couple people in the program who are social studies uh, educators and maybe folks are teaching other classes like math, like you mentioned. But um, uh, do you have any just like quick bullet points of if you were to bring um, climate change or Arctic science into a social studies class, something you think is a good starting point? Yeah, well, uh, I guess the, the point I'd like to make is that if you, the people who are living up there are on the front lines of this. Uh, and that for so many of us, well, you don't notice climate change because it takes place over a long time and, you know, you have anecdotal evidence, you know, the flowers are blooming a little earlier or something. And it's hard for people to grasp it, right? But not from the people who live up there because they are seeing it firsthand. And so uh, the stories of the people of the North is very, very, very important, right? Uh, and that's that's a good place to um, to go, right? There's also other kinds of this. There's some really interesting geopolitical issues arising there, right? As you lose the ice, shipping lanes opening, uh, or uh, there's a lot of oil, natural gas at the bottom of the ocean, right? And the prices are good. People will go after. Russia's already doing this, okay? And so that has economic potential in some way, right? But there's all kinds of issues in terms of indigenous lifestyles and like that. So that's all coming together, this whole geopolitical scene, okay? But really the thing is, you know, it's the people up there who are really seeing this firsthand. They need no convincing, no convincing at all because they see the ice disappearing. So that's, that's the lesson that I learned. The other thing though, as you see, is that there's all kinds of interest in working with the people of the North, but scientists generally are not good at it, right? You know, the stories I hear is like, oh, here's yet another scientist coming to help us, you know? That's not what we need, right? So the approach is not good, okay? It hasn't been very good, uh, but uh, there's work being done to try and improve that relationship because we can learn. Yeah. Anything else? I was just going to mention that, you know, and then I just posted it, that climate science is, is just so dynamic that as educators, it's, you go to sites um, like uh, NSIDC or um, my NASA data or, you know, the ITEX Aon network or, you know, whatever, whatever, there's, there's just so much data out there um, right. and it's, it is overwhelming. And so, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. That is probably for me is it is the struggle trying to navigate the data. Um, but it's because it's such a dynamic changing science that I think having a single repository or trying to link all of these amazing things would be logistic, logistically impossible. You just can't update it fast enough. Yeah. And, yeah. So can, can I can I add to that? Yeah. I think that we've for so long been so compartmentalized with now is math class and now is science class and now is social yeah. studies class. But I think that climate is um, a lens from which everything has to be seen and taught and understood through. I don't think it's separate because it, it affects everything. And I know that that's like a, that's, that's right. There's room for everyone there. There's room for everyone there. There's the physics side of it, right? You know, greenhouse gas and absorption spectra of carbon dioxide and things like that. Uh, there is uh, a, a social side of this, right? There's an economic side to this. Um, it, it, it's all there, right? And so, yeah, I would think, you know, climate change is something that is by its nature has to be incredibly interdisciplinary, right? And, Treat it that way, right? 
I think it's kind of, I think that's what I hear you're kind of getting at is you treat it as this sort of hub, right? Around which all these other things can feed into. All right. Uh, anybody else have a, a question before we wrap up here? Uh, uh, I will keep it to not a question, but one thing is that we've really focused on education and another big part of what we got to do is outreach. Yeah. Um, so maybe tomorrow part of our discussion can be, you know, how we're, if anybody's ever going to be interested in talking about climate change to an audience they don't know and that one-off situation, what that looks like, if people have tried that or not, um, the whole, almost a whole half of another yeah. thing that we're charged to do in our program. So maybe we'll, we'll just save that tomorrow, I guess. Yeah. And I would say, you know, use us. We're a resource. You know, National Snow and Ice Theater, we are a resource. This is what we do, right? And so uh, don't shy away from contacting us, asking questions. We've got good people who can ask, answer a lot and help you navigate some of this nightmare of data. Yeah, that's a, definitely a good resource. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight, and thank you, Mark, for a great presentation. Well, I'm glad uh, to help. I mean, I'm an educator myself, right? This is one of the hats <laughs> that I wear. This is in a different place, so it's a different set of headaches. That's all it is, right? <laughs>